to, uh, I guess, learn as you go um, from the way from the way we professors understand ourselves. Um, so uh, I am going to talk to you tonight about John Scotus uh, Erigena, uh, Erigena, I've heard it pronounced. Um, uh, I'll probably use about three or four different pronunciations as the night goes on. Uh, I'd just like to, to begin uh, with some preliminary remarks by way of, by way of introduction uh, to trying to understand uh, re really, really what we're doing is, is something very difficult. Trying to understand a, uh, a thinker uh, that is so uh, different from modern thinkers and who, is, uh, who lived in a time that is so different from, from our own. Unfortunately, and as a scholar of the Middle Ages, this, um, this tends to bother me uh, more than most, uh, the expression dark ages is used to uh, refer to the, the, the entire medieval period, the expression dark ages. And what it is, it, it's, it's simply misused. Uh, uh, dark ages is, uh, it, it is not uh, an accurate description for, for the period of time uh, that, that takes place between the fall of the Roman Empire, for, for example, and the Enlightenment. Uh, so the expression dark ages is often misused. However, if it applies to any century, it applies to the century in which John Scotus Erigena lived. That is to say the 9th century or the 800s. Uh, this, is a, this is a very dark time. We don't have a lot of intellectual activity going on. We don't have many saints from this, uh, from this century. Uh, it is a dark age, uh, which is why I entitled this talk, John Scotus Erigena, A Bright Light for a Dark Age. Now, to counter, provide a counterexample for the, uh, the idea that the dark ages is something that uh, it goes all the way from the fall of the Roman Empire to the enlightenment of the 17th or 18th century. Of course, the finest example of that is Thomas Aquinas and the, um, the, uh, the, the, the cultural renaissance that Thomas Aquinas uh, lives through and contributes to in large part in the 13th century. Uh, it's, it's really, however, not fair to compare somebody like Thomas Aquinas with someone like John Scotus Erigena. For the simple reason that Thomas Aquinas had simply had access to so many more things than John Scotus Erigena would have had access to. Uh, first and foremost, Thomas Aquinas had access, much, much fuller and much richer access to the writings of the ancient philosophers. That is to say, the ancient non-Christian philosophers, uh, especially the writings of Aristotle. The, the, the texts of Aristotle were translated into Latin uh, in Thomas Aquinas' own lifetime by one of his Dominican brethren. It, it was a, a tremendous advantage that he had. Thomas Aquinas had access to a university system that was just blossoming, beginning to blossom and take form. Uh, he, he himself was a professor at the University of Paris. Uh, the university system simply did not exist in the ninth century. Uh, all, all higher education to speak of uh, took place primarily in monasteries. And then finally, Thomas Aquinas had access to uh, the very energetic, uh, talented, and, um, and uh, successful Dominican order of which he was a part and which was the most scholarly uh, order in the entire church at the time. John Scotus Arena had no such access. Nevertheless, John Scotus Arena produced a really, a, a brilliant, brilliantly remarkable, and not only that, but original system of philosophy and theology without any of the benefits that his later uh, 13th century counterparts would have. And this is, I mean, there's no question about it, this is the only such achievement of the entire 9th century. 
an entire philosophical system uh, that is produced um, that is consistent, that is coherent, and that uh, that has has some actual originality. There really is no other such thinker in this century. Okay, well, let me just give you a, a brief a brief biography of um, of John Scotus uh, Ere Ere Regina. Um, so you know roughly where, where, we, where we are. Uh, of course, uh, we, all, we all know that uh, I wouldn't be here talking about him. Uh, he wasn't born in Ireland uh, in about the year 810. That's a rough estimate, but probably pretty accurate. And he, he spent much of his childhood and received uh, probably most of his education in an Irish monastery. And so, Eretina means just Literally, just from the uh, from the people of Aaron. Okay, so this is really just that, that's what his name actually means. And of course, don't let the uh, uh, I'm sure you won't. But uh, but uh, most people think when they hear John Scotus, uh, they think that he of course was Scottish rather than Irish. Uh, but of course, in the ninth century, the word Scotus does not uh, necessarily denote any connection with Scotland. Uh, since, of course, Ireland in the 9th century was called uh, Scotia Major, and that was, the, that was what, the, what the medievals would refer to it as. And, of course, in, in turn, the Irish themselves were called Scoti in Latin or Scots. So John Scotus would have, would have implied, of course, that he was Irish, not necessarily Scottish. Now, there is a remarkable fact that we can begin by noticing about uh, John Scotus Regina, Regina. Uh, and this is the fact that, that John knew Greek. He was perfectly uh, uh, fluent, uh, at least in, in reading and writing, in the Greek, the ancient Greek language. Now, this was extremely rare for the ninth century, and especially for ninth century Ireland. The study of Greek in the ninth century was actually uh, peculiar, in a way, to Irish monasteries. Uh, this, is, this is really a, an interesting fact. Uh, other uh, non-Irish philosophers of the time do use Greek phrases in their, in their writings, and some scholars have been led to conclude that they, that they too knew Greek. But uh, as, as, you, as anybody using common sense can, can say, uh, simply using a, a, a Greek phrase does not necessarily mean that you know Greek, uh, trying, to, trying to look back and piece the, the historical puzzle together, uh, any more than you know, if I use the term per se, or ipso facto, or something like that, doesn't necessarily imply that I know that. Right? Uh, people use those phrases all the time, not knowing uh, the language from which they come. In fact, the same logic can actually be used to, uh, to doubt the abundance of Greek knowledge even among, even among Irish writers. So it very well may be, to make a long story short, that John was one of the, the, uh, only a handful of people in his time uh, in Ireland that actually was conversant and, and, and knowledgeable of the Greek language. So this, this makes John's knowledge of Greek Really, all the more, all the more impressive. It, it doesn't. Uh, I, I may not have to remind some of you here that the great Saint Thomas Aquinas himself, probably the almost universally acknowledged as the greatest medieval philosopher of the entire thousand-year period, uh, even Thomas Aquinas didn't know Greek. He had to read Aristotle in Latin translations that were provided for him by his Dominican brother William of Narbonne. There is no question, however, that John, though John Scotus Irina, did know Greek, uh, because not only did he translate uh, volumes of writings of the church father Gregory of Nyssa, who of course was a, was a Greek author who wrote, wrote his text in Greek, fourth century theologian, uh, and also the, uh, the uh, ancient uh, theologian Pseudo Dionysius, uh, fifth late 5th, early 6th century theologian. Uh, 
but John actually attempted himself to write his own books in Greek. This was not the language that he used primarily. He wrote most of his books in Latin, of course. But uh, John even attempts to, to construct Greek verse of his own, which is just a, an extraordinary fact. He was obviously just heads and shoulders above every other intellectual of his time, as far as that is concerned. Now, we don't know exactly when, but sometimes in, sometime in the 840s, uh, John left Ireland and came to the continent, in particular France. He came specifically uh, to the really probably which at that time was the epicenter of uh, political uh, power uh, in the 9th century, that is to the court of Charles the Ball. Uh, this is a great medieval name. Uh, this is the, also the grandson of Charles of Charlemagne, the first Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, Charles the Bald is also known as, as Charles II. Uh, the Bible states uh, public relations advisor. I probably would have advised him to go with Charles II. I don't know why. Uh, Charles the Bald would have been any better. Um, uh, and of course, uh, he, he uh, John. John uh, comes to the court of, of Charles, who is the grandson of Charlemagne, the king of France at the time, and uh, later would be crowned as the Holy Roman Emperor as in, in the tradition of his grandfather Charlemagne. John Scotus uh, and Regina obtains a very prominent uh, position in the court of Charles. And uh, this, this uh, the intellectual uh, aspect of the the, uh, the academic aspect of side of, of this court is something called the Palatine School. It was founded all the way back in the days of Charlemagne, and really was originally intended as kind of a training ground for people to learn the, uh, the skills of of, uh, of knightly virtue. You know, uh, this was this was sort of a medieval kind of school where, where people would go to to become gen knightly gentlemen. But by the, very, uh, by the very direct dictate of Charlemagne himself, the Palatine School quickly became also a setting for much more intellectual pursuits as well. And it became, in a, in a way, in its own right, a kind of school of philosophy uh, as well. And this is, of course, what probably attracts John Scotus Arena to the Palatine School and to the court of Charles II in the first place. Some people even argue that the Palatine School was, uh, in all likelihood, uh, a kind of distant relative of the University of Paris, of course, the first great medieval university along with the University of Oxford and Bologna. And uh, because the, the, this Palatine School was then moved to the city of Paris by Charles II. Okay, so we don't really know if that's, if that's the case or not. You have to do some real uh, long-range connecting of the dots to, 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 to look at the Palatine School as the precursor to the University of Paris, but some, some people have done that. Now, John Scotus Origena got his, probably his intellectual uh, start when he was induced by the Bishop of Reims to settle a theological dispute over the whole concept of predestination. And uh, this, is, um, this is something that probably didn't have the greatest amount of success as far as, as, far as the, uh, the outside observer was concerned. John's settling of the dispute between two rival factions who had different interpretations of the whole idea of predestination resulted in a book that he wrote simply called, you know, in Latin, De Predestinatione, or On Predestination, uh, which, of course, we philosophers are, are, uh, are, are used to this, which, rather than settling this dispute, just you know, ended up pleasing neither side and getting, getting both sides angry at him. And it actually went so far as to bring John himself under suspicion of heresy. Now, this is a very important note, because John, would never really shake this suspicion. This, this, uh, this branding of John Scotus as a heretic 
would actually follow him around for the rest of his life. And in a way, it still haunts him to this day, because the uh, scholars who, who read him still raise the question as to whether or not he truly was a, uh, an Orthodox Christian or not, or whether he had kind of gone off to do that. I'll leave that to, uh, to you to decide uh, on your own. During his, his later uh, years as a scholar, uh, now living and working in France, John translated and, and really provided extensive commentaries on uh, most of the works of the great uh, 5th and 6th century theologians, Pseudo-Dionysius and also Gregory of Nyssa, uh, who are both, those two are uh, his two primary uh, intellectual influences, uh, Pseudo-Dionysius and Gregory of Nyssa. He spends much of his time as a scholar reading, contemplating, translating, uh, and uh, commenting upon their, their writings. Now, John's main book, probably the, 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 the book for which he is, he is widely read and widely celebrated as a major contributor to the history of philosophy, is a book called The Division of Nature, De Divisione Naturae, in, in Latin. And it was probably written sometime between 862 and 866. It is written in the style of a dialogue. Um, so in a way, uh, John John writes kind of like uh, kind of like Plato wrote. Uh, Plato would always write his books on philosophy as a dialogue between usually between Socrates and some uh, number of interlocutors that Socrates is talking with. Uh, John uh, chose to write in the same fashion his main work, De Divisione Natura. It's written as a dialogue between a student and a teacher. So the, the teacher and the student are having this conversation, and the student uh, is asking the teacher questions, and as the teacher begins to teach, uh, that in, in a way is supposed to represent John's teaching, the, the actual reader of the book. It's a very interesting way of, of writing, a very effective way of writing. The Division of Nature is a very difficult book to interpret. Uh, it is not an easy by any stretch of the imagination. And it does, I have to admit, leave some room for significant dispute as to whether John, in fact, was an, an Orthodox Christian or, or not. And again, I'll, I'll touch on some of, those, uh, some of those questions as I go on. Salvation is you know, of 
man from, from his sins. You know, all those things that the Christian religion teaches based on faith. Okay, so anyway, we'll have to we'll have to allow that to um, uh, to kind of sink in and to see whether or not John really uh, really believed that. Some also, and this also goes to explain why people accused him of being a heretic. Uh, some also accused John of being a pantheist. Okay, a pantheist. Uh, this this is a fancy word. Uh, for an atheist, <laughs> in a way. Uh, of course, for those of you who don't that aren't familiar with that term, uh, pantheist is just a way of saying that uh, you don't you don't really believe that God exists as anything distinct from the world. Basically, you say if you're a pantheist, you believe that the world uh, is just another. Uh, sorry, that the, 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 the expression God is really just another expression for the world. Okay, so you don't really believe that God is in any way transcendent or distinct from the world, but that, that every, the totality of everything in the world is just basically what God is. Okay? So some believe that he was a pantheist. That doctrine has been condemned by, by Christianity again and again. And as I said before, we can judge that for ourselves. Okay, well... I want to say a few things, and, and this, this lecture would be nothing if I didn't say uh, anything about John's actual philosophical uh, doctrine. And uh, let me let me preface this by saying that uh, this is no small this is no small feat. Uh, John's philosophical doctrine is is difficult, uh, not only because the division of nature is difficult, but it is really hard to understand what John is saying, what what he's getting at without some understanding of the, of the primary uh, intellectual tradition that he relies on. That intellectual tradition is the Neoplatonic tradition, okay? ultimately influenced by the philosophy of Plato and then advanced by certain, uh, certain other philosophers that came after Plato that uh, basically led uh, all of Plato's uh, writings to what they considered to be their logical conclusions. Okay, the, great, the greatest Neoplatonic philosopher is a fellow named Plotinus. Okay, so this is kind of where I'm coming from. And this is where John is coming from. Now, John's book is called The Division of Nature. And by nature, John means uh, not just what the Greek word for nature is, which is uh, phusis, which is where we get the word physics. So not just material nature, but by nature, John means all reality, sort of the, the entire cosmos. Okay. So he doesn't just mean physical nature, as the word would imply, but nature also includes God in John's mind. Now, for this reason, some people accuse him of being a pantheist, that his idea of nature includes God. But, but that, would, that would be to misunderstand John. He doesn't believe that uh, God and the, 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 the material world are the same thing. It's just that in his definition of nature, he means both. He means to include both. Okay, so, so if somebody accuses him of being a pantheist on that account, uh, not so fast. John has an idea of God that is very, very much influenced by the Neoplatonic tradition. It really boils down to two ideas. On one hand, God is, according to John, the first cause. That is to say, everything exists solely because God created it. And that may sound like a simplistic point to me. But uh, John, John considers it to be crucial. God is the first cause from which all being proceeds. That, that, that's how he, would, how he would explain it. On the other hand, God is not only the first cause, but God is also what, what John would call the final goal of all things as well. So not only do all things, uh, and this is kind of a technical word that the Neoplatonists use, 
not only do all things emanate from God, but all things are striving to return to God as well. And these, th this, is, this is the idea that John wants to get across more than anything else regarding who God is and God's relationship to the world. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, John's major influence is the philosophy and theology of Pseudo-Dionysius, who is uh, an cr early Christian writer who is heavily, heavily influenced by the Neoplatonic tradition and ultimately the philosophy, the philosophy of Plato himself. Now, according to Neoplatonic philosophy, and really according to Plato's philosophy as well, there, there exists something called the eternal ideas. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm condensing <laughs> probably a whole semester's worth of, <laughs> of, uh, of material into about five minutes here, so please try to bear with me. The, Plato believed that apart from the material world, apart from the physical world that we, that we see in front of us, there exists a world of, uh, that is actually more real than the material world itself. And these, th this, this world contains the fundamental principles of the things that we see in front of us. And these fundamental principles Plato called the eternal ideas, or sometimes also called forms. Okay. So, uh, one of the forms, uh, all of the forms are, are abstract. They're not, they're not concrete. You can't touch them or, or see them. You can only know them with your intellect. So, for example, uh, you have the, the concept or the idea of justice. You might have a just law that you can look at. You might have a just uh, government that you can admire. <laughs> you might have a just, uh, a just person over here, but and you could see and touch and and, and uh, all the, all of those things, but you can't see or touch justice itself. Okay? You can only know that with your mind. And yet, Plato insisted, justice itself exists. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense to talk about a just law or a just person or a just government or anything like that. So justice itself must exist, uh, not just as an idea in our minds, but as an actual reality. Uh, other things in nature correspond to some other eternal idea. For example, uh, one of the eternal ideas is humanity. You know, I can see, I can see this, this human here and this human there and that human over there, uh, and I can see them and touch them, uh, but, I, but I cannot see or touch humanity. Right? Humanity is, is, is one of these eternal, abstract ideas. Uh, it exists apart from individual human beings. So, uh, you know, anyway, these are, these are the ideas. One more example, and this is probably my favorite example. Uh, one of the eternal ideas is that of beauty. You can see, uh, you can go to Ireland and you can see a beautiful landscape. You can see a beautiful person. You can see a beautiful, you know, flower or, or painting. But you cannot see with your eyes beauty itself. And yet, there must be such a thing as beauty, so uh, it must exist somewhere, <laughs> but it doesn't exist in any physical place. So the world of the forms is distinct from the material world, but it doesn't exist in any location anywhere because it's not a, they aren't physical things that are there. This is really the basis of all Neoplatonic philosophy, because the whole goal of the philosopher is to come to understand what these forms are. The whole goal of the philosopher is to understand what justice is. The goal of the philosopher is to understand what beauty is, 
or to understand what what uh, humanity is. So this is this is right at the core of pseudo Dionysius's philosophy and John's philosophy as well. Now one more thing about about uh, Plato's theory of the eternal ideas. One of the other eternal ideas was something that Plato called the good. But the good, in a way, had a different status from all these other examples that I've given you. The good was almost like, it was like the supreme form. <laughs> okay. The good had a, had a different status than something like justice or beauty or humanity or, or anything like that. When Plato talked about the good, he meant the, the ultimate and supreme reality of the entire cosmos. In a way, the good is, is that from which all the forms come. So if it wasn't for the good, there would be no justice, there would be no uh, beauty, there would be no humanity, there would be nothing. Now, as far as Plato's concerned, that's the end of the story. That's the end of the story. But when John reads Plato, John, as a Christian, Looks at Plato, or looks at Plato, looks at the, the, the writings of Pseudo Dionysius, uh, and he says, okay, what Plato called the good, that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Plato didn't realize that, but nevertheless, that is what he was really contemplating, whether he realized it or not. So, being a pre Christian philosopher, Plato actually came to some very true conclusions. He just didn't realize that his, well, the, the principle that he called the good was really God. So John follows this tradition of pseudo Dionysius and Gregory of Nyssa by saying that Plato's concept of the good is really the Christian God, and that all the forms like beauty and justice and humanity and so on, are actual ideas in God's mind. So God has an idea of humanity in his mind, and he creates individual human beings in accordance with that idea or ideal of humanity. So we'll come back to that uh, in, a, in a little while, in, uh, towards the end here. Now, there are, of course, problems in trying to reconcile an ancient Greek philosopher like Plato or Plotinus with Christianity. Even though Plato believed in a transcendent principle which he called the good, Plato did not believe that the good was a god or a creator of any kind. Also, Plato did not believe that the good was really a person at all, like Christians believe about God. Okay, so there's kind of a there's kind of a separation here between Plato and and uh, Christianity, which somebody like John would have wanted to understate. Of course, the problem is inherited by John, just as though, just as it was inherited by other early Christian Neoplatonists like Pseudo Dionysius and Gregory of Nyssa, who are trying to reconcile their Platonism with their Christian faith. This, again, becomes a, a perpetual problem that, uh, that such philosophers continually have. Now, again, I want to come back to uh, what I mentioned at the beginning was really the central teaching of John's philosophy and theology. Again, first, that everything in nature comes from God in the sense that everything that exists exists as some representation of one of the divine ideas. Okay? So, th this is the idea. Everything in nature has an essence. Everything in nature has an essence. Uh, another word for essence is, is uh, everything in nature has uh, some fundamental principle which makes it to be what it is. 
what's the fundamental principle that makes a human being human? Well, it's humanity. <laughs> what's the fundamental principle that makes a, I don't know, a dog a dog? Well, what would you call it? Dogness. <laughs> yeah. What's the fundamental principle that makes, um, you know, a, a horse a horse or a tree a tree? It's it's, it's treeness. You know, John believed that because we see all of these things in front of us in the world, human beings and dogs and trees and other natural forms, uh, that that dogness and treeness and and humanity and whatever infinite other number of, of things there are in the world, these concepts must be concepts in God's mind. So before there were any human beings, God had the idea of humanity, God must have had the idea of humanity in his mind, in accordance with which he created human beings. Before there were any dogs, God must have had the eternal concept of dogness in his mind before he created any actual dogs. You know, before there existed any trees, God must have had the eternal idea of uh, treeness in his mind before he created any trees, and, and so on. And this is the idea that, that is really at work in John's whole uh, philosophy and theology. Now, just as, again, just as I said before, just as everything is striving, or just as everything is created by God, uh, on the basis of these ideas that God has in his mind, or must have in his mind, so also, and this, this really is John's kind of brilliant, I, I think, his synthesis between ancient, ancient philosophy and Christianity. So also, all of these things in nature are or, or should be striving to come back to the perfection or the ideal in accordance with which God originally created them. So, in other words, uh, the, the concept of humanity that God created human beings with is an ideal that human beings should constantly be striving to return to. I, in other words, how do this is kind of this is kind of gets into sort of John's you know, ethical thought. How, how do I live my life as a human being? Well, John's answer would be, I should live my life as closely as possible according to the ideal of humanity that God originally intended in creating human beings in the first place. Whatever that happens to entail. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what John is, is, uh, is constantly trying to, to teach us. To be, in other words, to be striving to become the most perfect representation of humanity that one can possibly become. Now, this isn't all just a recapitulation of Greek philosophy. John insisted that this is only possible through Jesus Christ. This is only possible through Jesus Christ because. Jesus Christ is an incarnate representation of that perfect humanity that every individual is striving or should be striving to imitate. God understands that human beings are confused as to what humanity really entails, perfect humanity really entails. And so he gives us a living, breathing model a living, breathing model in the person of Christ. In the person of Christ. Well, so far so good as far as John's orthodoxy is concerned. There do creep in problems again, though. And this again, these are these are reasons for which John was often accused of being a, a heretic. Although John does emphasize the role of Christ, he does place Christ at the very center of his theology. He says some things which caused people to uh, to wonder about it. 
First of all, John discusses in his main work, The Division of Nature, that eventually, after human beings die, eventually, our resurrected bodies will be transformed into spirit. Now, it's hard to know what he means by that. It's hard to know what he means by that. Now, by this time, the Catholic Church had pretty well defined the doctrine of the resurrection of the body. That human beings, after death, will have their bodies raised again. Our bodies will be perfect, and they will exist all throughout eternity, and there will be no death ever again. So what, is, what does John mean when he says that our resurrected bodies will be transformed into spirit? What is a spiritual body at all? I mean, it, it almost seems as though he's, he's saying that we won't have bodies that will just be kind of like angels uh, floating around in heaven. Uh, if, if he's saying that, then he's certainly out of accordance with the Orthodox Catholic tradition there. Secondly, John says that eventually, there will be an ultimate unification between human beings in heaven and God. And that is, that, that's okay so far as that goes, but his exact words are very weird and troubling. He says, uh, quote, for God will be all in all. And this is like in the fullness of time. God will be all in all, where nothing will exist but God alone. And so it almost sounds like John is saying that, that after, in, in the fullness of time, uh, you know, after the last judgment, that all human being, individual souls, and indeed all things, you know, completely, will just be kind of absorbed into God, right? <laughs> Thus being sort of annihilated into, sort of subsumed into God's eternal being. Um, now, there's a couple ways to read John as far as these things go. Uh, and, and arguments, I think very convincing arguments can be made to say that, no, he doesn't really mean that. He doesn't really mean that, they, that all uh, human souls will just be absorbed into God in the fullness of time. When he talks about the unification of the human soul to the divine essence, he's, he's talking about something much, um, much, more, uh, much more metaphorical than that, that there'll just be kind of a unification uh, God and, and the human soul between the, the, the lover and the lover, something like that. Also, when he says that our resurrected bodies will be transformed into spirits, uh, it's very easy to read him as saying just that our resurrected bodies will be uh, just kind of elevated and made perfect uh, in, in the likeness of, of a spiritual being. But, but not to say that he's denying that we will still have bodies in the uh, Afterlife. So those things, although they, they, they raise questions, I think they raise answerable questions. The real difficulty comes for interpreting John's orthodoxy, in my view anyway, the real difficulty comes with John's understanding of the afterlife and of the eternal salvation and or punishment of human souls. John is emphatic that all things, just as all things come from God, all things will return to God as well. All things will return to God as well. And so, in the traditional sense, there really can be no eternal punishment, if that is true. If all things are destined to return to God, there can really be no eternal punishment. So what about all these passages in the Bible where Jesus is talking about souls being punished and there being wailing and gnashing of teeth and all those things we can read in the New Testament? What does that all mean if John is right to say that all things return to God? Well, John has a very interesting explanation of that. According to him, Eternal punishment consists not in being sent to some place of eternal damnation. All souls will be in heaven with God for all eternity. Eternal
eternal punishment consists, rather, in the, in the, the soul's persisting tendency to desire all those lower material things that they desired on earth. Okay? Whether it's physical pleasure, power, money, etc. Okay, so so it's kind of like this, you know, everybody is in heaven with the beatific vision, enjoying the eternal glory of God. But if you had, you know, a weakness for donuts in your life, you know, you're gonna be constantly mad and distracted from the beatific vision by this 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 darn craving for donuts, you know, so, something like that, you know. Um, you know, fill in the blank with, with, with whatever it is, you know, a person's weakness happens to be, you know. But, but this is how John explains it. You know, God, in, in sort of a, as a measure of sort of poetic justice, uh, does not cleanse the will, the human will, of all of those lower desires that it had. Okay, so uh, that, that's basically what eternal punishment consists in. It's a very interesting way of, of explaining it. And this is what uh, this is what uh, Jesus means when he talks about the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. Wanting to know it so bad and knowing that you can't have it. Okay. Um, just to conclude with a few a few remarks here. Um, the the impact of John's philosophy is has been really kind of mixed throughout the, the years. Um, although his main book, The Division of Nature, was, was widely read and widely celebrated and widely praised, uh, it was eventually, this is, this is interesting, it was eventually adopted by, uh, in the, in the uh, early 13th century, John's Division of Nature was adopted by the Albigensians. And, and they, they thought that John's um, writings were very profound, uh, and they thought it went, very, went along very well with the, their own Albigensian sort of dualistic idea. If you don't know anything about the Albigensians, the Albigensians believe that all physical matter is evil, and that the, whole, the goal of, of, of human life should be to, uh, to uh, keep body, this one's own physical body down as much as possible, even to the point of, of uh, inflicting terrible physical suffering on themselves. So some Albigensians would actually starve themselves right to death because they thought that they would, would only be happy when their souls This eventually led to the condemnation of John's division of nature in the year 1225. Uh, it was actually ordered by Pope Honorius III to be uh, to be burned. Uh, this, of course, this order wasn't uh, universally followed, of course, which is why we still have and can read John's Division of Nature. Now, this would be uh, compounded. This uh, rejection of John's of John's uh, theology would be compounded by the Church's eventual uh, embrace of the Aristotelian, the, the, the tradition of Aristotle, over the tradition of Plato. Okay, so the fact that John was not a follower of Aristotle, but rather of the Platonic tradition, this would uh, even add more fuel to the fire as to why his, his writings were not taken as seriously later on as they, as they had been when they were first written. In the end, it just seemed to become too difficult to reconcile a philosophy that emphasizes the importance of spirit over the body, such as the philosophy of Plato and ultimately of John, with a religion, namely Christianity, that teaches that God himself took on human flesh and that the body will one day be resurrected. Okay. The philosophy of Aristotle, which emphasized the importance and the reality of physical matter, after all, Aristotle was a biologist uh, before anything else. Uh, that, that philosophy became the, the philosophy of choice in the, at least in, towards the end of the 13th century. Now, there have been, in the history of Christianity, there have been Christian philosophers who really 
just want to give lip service to Christianity. And don't really have any commitments to Christianity uh, per se. They're writing in the Christian era, though, and so they feel as though they have to please the authorities that, that are there, the powers that be, and so they, they provide lip service to Christianity, but they aren't really Christians themselves. They're philosophers first, they're Christians second. I don't believe that John was such a, a philosopher. When you read his writings, you really, you really are convinced that he believed very deeply in the fundamental truth of the Christian gospel and also of the philosophy of Plato. To him, there was no distinction between these two. Plato was completely confirmed by the Christian gospel, and the Christian gospel was completely confirmed by the philosophy of Plato. This has sometimes uh, led people, to, uh, including John, to stretch the gospel uh, sometimes beyond what it is originally uh, intended to mean. But I don't think that there is any question that John was a Christian and that he thought that he was providing a tremendous service for the church and for all people of goodwill in in uh, reconciling these two great traditions, the Christian and the Neoplatonic. So I think that's probably a good place to stop. So thank you very much for listening tonight.
the ones that have, and this is something I didn't talk about before, the ones that have the sort of the most prominence in heaven, the ones that live the best lives, are there because of the of the incarnate Christ, which teaches them this eternal concept of humanity that they can somehow become in their own action. Um, so I did my best to, to get to your question. Please follow that up if, if I didn't hit it right on the head. Yeah, and and, and, and what I see here somehow is that creation is a good in itself, even when it creates creatures who will be condemned always to be dissatisfied. Yeah. Always to be yearning for something that they cannot have. And yet, that is, that is good. Or it's yeah. part of the good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, I think that John, I mean, I think one of the things that John is held in suspicion about is the fact that he doesn't make hell as bad for people as the, the, the Christian tradition seems to want it to be. You know, because it's still, after all, this person who spends eternity craving, you know, a donut, you know, who can't have it. That person is still in the presence of God, uh, technically speaking. Uh, and, and this is where, again, I think if you're going to accuse him of, of, of heterodoxy anywhere, it's this, because I think it's, if the Catholic tradition has made one thing clear, the damned, damned in, in hell are not in the presence of God. Right? John says that they are. They just have this, this longing, this eternally frustrated longing uh, for whatever it is that they desire on earth. So that's uh, so. I think I mean in a way, John is is uh, a lot softer on, on the, the souls, the damned souls than you know than the Christian tradition would want him to be. Is the impact that more modern that is more in keeping with the way we would like things to be <laughs> that went through. That's which modern you're talking about. <laughs> um, you know you know who has a very similar I'm not I'm not a professional theologian, I'm not a philosopher, but you know who has a very similar uh, idea uh, in terms of this universal return to God is the great uh, the great um, theologian Hans Wurstmann Balthasar. Uh, apparently there's a lot of similarity there between Balthazar, who is very influenced by the Neoplatonic tradition as well, uh, and, uh, and someone like John. I don't know how much the Balthazar read John's Codicilia, but uh, but there is a kind of almost a kind of universal doctrine of universal salvation in, in from Balthazar. So uh, you know, you talk about him, maybe so, but uh, if you talk about someone else. Carl Barth, for example, then no. <laughs> yes, uh, this is uh, from last week of religion. And then it is always about the end of uh, uh, the death. Um, there is, uh, there is a, we, we don't know a whole lot about that. I don't know, not many people know about his demise. Um, there is a, uh, a tradition that has him. Uh, let's see. Um, he, he probably did not outlive Charles II. That's uh, this historians have kind of put that put put that together. There are some uh, some stories about a John the Scotus uh, becoming kind of a prominent figure in, in various monasteries in France, but. Uh, more modern scholars have, have cast a lot of doubt on that. Probably say that's probably some other John, uh, not not the same as the, as the philosopher. So he kind of falls off the map. Well, we just had a report by one scholar who went to the other. Now, of course, there's a uh, legend that he was put to death by students in the degree group. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I have not heard that actually. That's uh, John Macquarie. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, it's pretty clear to me that, that John's influences were Gregory of Nyssa and the Those Those are his primary intellectual forebearers. And, and, uh, um, now, he does, you know, he doesn't, I mean, he, his, his philosophy is somewhat original. It's not just a recapitulation of theirs. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if uh, if there was a, a preference for for the, the the ancient Greek philosophers in some way for the uh, in the Irish uh, tradition than um, Connor. Um, you, you certainly see a preference for the Greek thinkers in the Byzantine uh, the Byzantine church, and, and I would not know whether there was some kind If there is, then I think you're really on something. You know, then you're really on something. But um, but that would have to be the connection, I think, somehow. Uh, so yeah, that's as far as I can go with that. So. No. Going, going. <laughs> ah. Okay. Uh, any other questions you can put to our speaker uh, one on one? Uh, I want to thank you for your very intriguing, very interesting.
coming that distance is a bit of a good crowd thing. Uh, and this topic, of course, is, is uh, near and dear to uh, well, people who love poetry.